Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Lu Lin, uh, CEO and founder of VLight. I'm going to be talking about quantum elements in brain photobiomodulation, new discoveries and new theories. Now, this is going to cover quite a lot of new things that are unfamiliar to many folks in photobiomodulation who are really very much into biology and, and medicine. So this is in the realm of physics. And, and as many of you know, physics is foundational in even the other disciplines of science like chemistry and biology. I'm hoping that this will advance uh, our knowledge of how the brain works on its own and particularly with uh, photons either from the outside or something new here from the inside of the brain. So what am I talking about? Well, we've been uh, using this quite a lot. I would say this is kind of standard biological model of, of uh, photobiomodulation in general. And here is more specifically to uh, transcranial photobiomodulation or photobiomodulation of the brain. Uh, very briefly, there are there are other speakers and presenters who will be uh, touching on these mechanisms, but very broadly speaking, it centers on the functioning of the mitochondria, which you know goes through this electron transport process or respiratory chain, producing the uh, molecules that lead to gene transcription, like reactive oxygen species, ATP, obviously, which is also a secondary molecule, and some uh, some other uh, molecules like nf kappa b which leads to you know what it, how it works in the immune system. If it is within a certain range of wavelength, like 600 to say 980 or around about 1,000, uh, it usually works on the cytochrome C oxidase. That's the theory. Uh, longer than that, could be working on the you know the RPV ion channel, or today there's more discussion on the effect on water structure. But uh, let's move on. And I, I believe this model is incomplete. Um, we've been on this for so many years, we kind of get used to it, but let me show you why. So we've been doing a lot of work in understanding how the brain functions and how it is represented in electrical signals in EEG. Um, so something like this, you've seen pictures of it, but it is just um, telling you how the brain is, is represented in brain waves. And there are several frequencies you can relate it to different conditions or what your state of mind is. Uh, this is widely used in the neurofeedback uh, community. Uh, many of them clinical psychologists in trying to figure out how your brain works and, def and then uh, get onto retraining your brain. So we published a paper we, um, that was uh, quite well uh, received and, and uh, cited in the field of you know, EEG and what's happening. Now, what we discovered, which is novel at the time, was when we delivered 40 hertz to the brain. Um, this was never um, revealed before. Delivering 40 hertz to the brain, you actually amplify the high, higher frequency, like alpha, beta, gamma. Um, I don't want to go into, you know, spend time you know, trying to, you know, relate this to various things, but just take it as the changes in brain wave patterns. But what was interesting is while we are increasing the power of the faster frequency, we are reducing the power of the lower frequency, like uh, delta and theta, which is more related to to sleepiness or sleep and um, you know inattention and stuff like that. So this has an impact on how uh, practitioners who use EEG um, can relate it to how you know photobiomodulation may be treated with 40, 40 hertz. You can look at it this way. This is quite commonly used in you know, brain maps with you know uh, in QEEG. So the top line is a Baseline is normal without a treatment and the, and the lower line 
um, shows the changes. This way, when it goes to yellow and red, there is more stimulation when it goes, and green is normal, below green, which is blue, uh, there's a reduction in the, the power, if you like. So there are, so the brain function can be frequency related when you deal with photobiomodulation. You can look at co connectivity. This is a way of analyzing the connectivity as the result of this event. Now, um, the, it measures when you, the, the blue actually is uh, pre-treatment and the red lines are post. So you want to see what the changes are. The way you look at it is the separation between the red and the blue. The way you see these gray vertical lines, it shows uh, more changes in connectivity. So we, we are relating this also to the connectivity among in the neurons of your brain. So that's good. So we have now, you know, looking at brainwave changes as well as the uh, connectivity, especially in the brain networks. This is uh, interesting, significant. And what we found uh, very interestingly is overall, what you see this in increase in stimulation and power. Actually, we found that overall there is net inhibition in the brain. Now, what does this mean? When your brain is functioning, act, doing activity, there is, uh, you know, you want to have control as well. The brain has a way of balancing itself. So, so inhibition is good. We took this and um, then suggested, among other things, 40 hertz could be interesting for Alzheimer's disease treatment. We had some earlier studies on 10 hertz and got, have had good results. Uh, Linda Chow of UCSF thought, okay, let's, this is interesting. Let me try and replicate what you uh, found earlier. And I suggested, okay, look at 40 hertz because of its ability to help me the, deal with the tox, excitotoxicity when the brain is function, functioning. And there are, <clears throat> there are published literature showing that it helps with memory encoding. And then around that same time, MIT came up with uh, with a great study showing that uh, 40 hertz delivered to animals in the cage actually reduced these biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease like beta amyloid and later on uh, tau. So that's relevant. And she did this independently and showed interesting things other than the usual cognitive assessments on you know, the improvements in the brains of, of dementia patients. She did what something that was not done previously uh, with photobiomodulation in the brain, which is uh, using an fMRI, and you can see the imaging. Now you may not, you may, you may not have a placebo or sham group to compare with, but you you can't full imaging. It is objective. It is what it is, and there are clear, uh, at least maintenance when we compare it against against the um, uh, the control group. There is pretty clear, at least maintenance or even improvement in the blood perfusion after 12 weeks. So we are now um, using this knowledge and we are actually uh, two years into our clinical trials. We've been, we've been uh, suspended over the past one and a half years because of the pandemic. Hopefully we get going again. This is going to be major if we see uh, results, it will be indisputable. It involves 228 subjects over multi <coughs> multiple sites. It is reviewed by FDA and Health Canada. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I don't think we will see the end of the clinical, the pivotal, at least this big study, or we have a pilot study going on now. Uh, this big study for at least another two years, it just takes time, you know. Now, with all that, say, hey, what happened to other frequencies? How about 10 hertz, which is very common in, in the world of EEG? You know, when you close your eyes, rest, do nothing, um, your brain is in this uh, default mode and, and alpha mode, which is 10 hertz. So we did this study on healthy subjects. <clears throat> Interesting too, a little bit different from the gamma. Uh, this is again looking at the uh, way to represent what's happening in the brain, looking at the you know, QEEG map. Interestingly, we have this 
uh, we tried different position, you know, and default position and different random positions and even intranasal only. We found that immediately after a 10 minute treatment, we can see the baseline is the top line and the second line um, is immediately after 10 minute treatment, there are significant stimulation. Even in this time, uh, the theta, theta brief wa uh, brain wave. So it covers from theta right up to gamma, but a reduction in delta. 30 minutes on, uh, which is telling us how much the brain can maintain, how long this, this efficacy. So 30 minutes, minutes later, there wasn't really much changes. The brain actually um, has been modulated and sustained that for, for, for quite a long time. Now the difference is that the, the, the bottom the, between the 30 minutes and 10 minutes is only, only in the very, very slow wave, the delta that we see there is, even after 30 minutes, actually it continues to work on delta. Uh, which is giving it more power. Now, this is uh, an interesting thing we find here uh, is when we did an arm, we just intranasal only, we see significant changes too, uh, which is more inhibitory versus the, the baseline. So this is pre-publication um, right now, but I'm sharing this um, information with you. So that was all about EEG. That's another uh, common way of imaging a brain to you know, put your brain through an MRI scanner. This work was done and published actually sometime in uh, spring last year by a work done in the City University of New York. And this was really interesting. I, I wish this had actually more, more, uh, more, more coverage outside. So they delivered a laser at you know, uh, 318 milliwatts for 10 minutes on the, the forehead um, on continuous mode. And they could do it in a MRI scanner and found this, if you go down uh, and look at the, the various, the three echoes they did. When they turn on uh, after five minutes, it's within like two minutes, you can see the brain responding already and then turn it off after another 10 minutes, the brain rests, rests back. And this is uh, actually replicated. So it says that the brain responds very quickly and quite acutely. And then on the top right, the response from the brain is brain white, it's global. So it wasn't like you deliver to the forehead and it stays there, but actually you see a response uh, totally from the brain. And what is actually very important, uh, I thought was, there was no change in temperature. So this wasn't an effect of heat. It is purely the effect of photons to the brain. Now we are planning to start a study with um, Baycrest, which is in Toronto, uh, looking at more variables, you know, like different positions, uh, 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 with the laser in, in this uh, scanner. We had to design it especially to allow this to happen, play around with frequencies and see what happens. So that's the future, hopefully not too, too long. Now the biological model explains quite a number of things. This is, um, and many of you in brain photobiomodulation already know what these are mainly to do with you know, improved circulation and growth factors uh, that improves the functioning of the brain. But that model does not explain right, what we have been observing in this other imaging, the electrical signals and what happens you know, in the, the, you know, the, the presentations in, in the, the, um, the, the process that the brain is going through. Now let's take the brain on its own. We've just been over the Olympics not too long ago. If you recall, if you watch the Olympics, the sprinters were disqualified if they launched 0.1 second. It's always repeat. Okay, this guy got caught at taking off at 0.1 second or 100 milliseconds after the gun. Your brain 
cannot, uh, you know, uh, truthfully respond that quickly. But on the other hand, our brain responds to external stimuli at about 150 milliseconds. Okay. And when you look at how these springers are taking off, they take off at the, around 140, usually 140, 142, or say 0.142, 0.145 uh, uh, of one second. So that's how quick they, um, everything is taking place. But think about it, in, in neuroscience, the understanding is the electrical and chemical signaling in the synapses take um, actually 0 0.5 to, to one millisecond to, to make it happen. If you take 0 0.5 uh, millisecond and say 150 uh, millisec milliseconds for things to take place, it is, you only need 300 connections for it to happen. Because, and think about it, our brain has 86 billion neurons and each neuron has 1000 connections. And you're talking about say 86 trillion uh, connections taking place when the whole brain's processing. But actually in most things that you do, it involves all the brain. There's no such thing as only a specific part of the brain is responding. Let's take this for example. The sound of a gun, the auditory process, you know, the ear auditory process processing it, it goes through your amygdala because your emotional response. Uh, it, 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 it also affect, uh, works on the hippocampus. You, you have to use your memory to process things. Um, you have to involve uh, prefrontal cortex to make a decision whether to take off or not. And then there is the basal ganglia, you know, it's go and no go instruction giving up. Now, and then they have, they have to send instructions and not just your leg or your foot, it's your arms and everything. Think about it. Uh, can it be explained by just 300 connections? Not possible. It's probably in the billions. So something else is happening. And we, you have to think about, you know, the qualities that uh, the, 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 the quantum mechanics present to us and try to explain this. So the brain is processing fast and rapidly and global. This is what's happening in the brain. And then when we talk about introducing light and photons into the brain, we can now try to equate what is almost now widely accepted in photosynthesis. In the traditional model for a long time, we thought, okay, the, the plant or the bacteria, is many plant and bacteria having the chromophores to do this receive the photons, do this, uh, find its way to the reaction center and produce ATP and energy and so on. But in the quantum, it cannot possibly explain how it's able to do that. But um, today there's more modeling and more um, experimentation going on explaining it through a quantum model when the photons go, uh, is received by the chromophores in the plant of bacteria, it finds it process all possibilities, all past pathways to the reaction center and just go there. And the, the, um, the, the time, the response time is in, in like millions of a second. So, so it cannot be just a chemical electrical process. Our mitochondria shares, uh, similarities to say bacteria, which processes, you know, does the photosynthesis process. Both have many DNAs in common and they uh, go through a process and produce ATP. Now, there's, now you can start to think, you know, when we deliver light to the uh, mitochondria, there is some quantum processes going on. Now, this is just a broad, concept to lead ourselves into, you know, slowly accepting the idea of uh, quantum processing. So what happens when you, um, uh, just in a, the functioning of the mitochondria. Now, there is quite a number of studies going on. It goes back 
you know, uh, probably 20 years now on the production of biophotons by the mitochondria. It just seems to be part of his process. It's not uh, much discussed in our field in photo bio biomodulation, uh, but it has been measured. And if uh, in, in physics, you think about uh, Bohr's theory on the energy that ex when you deliver an energy to the atom, you know, you excite the uh, electron, it goes to a highest energy state and comes back down again, it releases a photon. So that is, that is what you can expect to happen. Endogenously in ourselves, mitochondria is producing it and seems to be <clears throat> delivering the photons to the microtubules. The microtubules are what holds cells together, but in the, um, in the neurons, in the axons, they are pretty structured, uh, very interesting, lining up straight and has the potential to, to do something about signals. Now, here is a caveat on quantum mechanics. The among, quant, uh, among quantum physicists, you know, you really need to be free of what we call interference and decoherence for uh, quantum processes to take place, like super positioning or entanglements and so on. It cannot, and that is happening really, really fast. Now, when you are in a warm environment, uh, messy like the brain or organic structure, it, it cannot happen. It, it just, but it doesn't quite reconcile the fact that we see the outcomes, but you say it's not, it's not happening. Um, so that's why, you know, when you do, um, you, in quantum uh, computers, they have to bring the temperature, temperature down as close as possible to, to absolute zero to, to remove this, this, you know, this, this interference. Now, with the brain, this is not happening. So we need some kind of media channel and it seems like the microtubule is as good bet as anybody. Here is um, often presented with a um, with a group um, that has kind of initiated by Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, who received a Nobel Prize for Physics uh, recently, and he said that the microbes seem to have the structure to allow this to happen. It's asymmetrical. It has this um, the you know, it's uh, the lattices seem to be in the right, rightly structured. So that is a possibility, and there's quite a lot of work going on now um, among uh, the people in this group. The original argument was this, these dipoles and the tubulin, you know, the the positive and negative uh, creating a field. But today um, they are looking more into the structure of some of the the aromatic rings in the molecules to allow this to happen. So this is just without going too deeply. This uh, I'm saying, you know, the molecule is a good way to look at it. Now, um, the biophotons are getting emitted, so centering, sending through the microtubules as a possible way to allow quantum mechanics to happen. To allow that to happen, and this is measured in some studies, you know, you, you can put a proton counter uh, or CCD camera, you can see uh, biophotons emission. And it is related to um, the reactive oxygen species. Remember, reactive oxygen species, RRS, is one of the um, molecules that is released in the process of photobiomodulation by cytochrome C oxidase. So when you release RRS, you can, in the process of biophoton release, actually trigger release of biophotons. So, Endogenously, it goes through this process. Biophoton is a quantum particle. It allows quantum processes to happen. To happen. It can go through, uh, theoretically, the microtubules. This is a review. There's not too many studies that relate to photobiomodulation or uh, low-level light therapy um, on biophoton activity. But here is a discussion paper that's, that looked at the biophoton counts when you deliver low level light therapy and it seems to actually induce releases of bio, biophotons uh, when you put on the leg, forehead, hands. So that is, uh, has been measured 
perhaps you could do more work on looking at various wavelength defect. Another model has been suggested, very interestingly, to try to um, explain, you know, how biophotons can affect the brain um, like that. It's in the exploring the exons. The exons are these long strands that your cell body sends signals through to the, the dendrites and, and, and so on. Now, the, the synapses. Now, the, the look at the model and suggest that, yeah, you know, this um, exons, the myelin sheath particularly, seems to be have the right kind of structure to work like optic fiber and send photons through them. And remember, uh, you know, the, the brain has got 86 billion neurons with 10, with 1,000 connections each. So it, it, if that is happening, it allows if, um, outcomes to take place at the speed of light. A little bit different look at it. Then we look at this. Uh, I think that's not really explored too much in even in neuroscience, but this is emerging there are such a phenomenon called microstates that can be measured in EEG in the brain. Uh, what, 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 what is this? You know, it, if you look at a certain aspect of it, just pull up a, at a certain point in time, measure a, um, the brain wave, you, you find that the whole brain pattern can be represented in, in a lower and lower level, even to very low level. And there's some suggestion maybe in atomic state. So, so at any point in time, they could be milliseconds to a few seconds, there are certain structures that are happening. And all the time it is saying that this is reliable, it's reliable. We could, uh, studies have clustered them into four main classes, A, B, C, D. They represent like 70, 80% of of, of this and this is what is, um, is seen on the top right, you know, four groups. Now they, you can look at it like the Russian nesting dolls, you know, you take out the big one, you keep removing smaller and smaller structures, the smallest structure in the, in the whole uh, collection actually is, is the same as the biggest one. So it is, it, this is a way of looking at trying to understand microstates. But what, what, what does um, it mean? You know, that is being still continuing to be studied, and the various group can be eventually relate to a certain specific condition of mental state. So we did this in collaboration with Reza Tomorodi. He's also, he's also speaking at this conference. I, I'm not sure. I think he might be covering this area in more depth. But we found that there was significant change in a particularly group A when we delivered gamma at 40 hertz to the brain. Not many people can do this analysis or credit the result because we really need technical expertise and a lot of work. Now, why do we care? Um, okay, I've talked about reliability. We can in the future use this in some way, but what we found, and this is what Risa is telling me is, and he's an expert in EEG, uses TMS, TDCS, all kinds of brain stimulation. For the biomodulation, we the only modality we know that, that can change microstates. So something to be explored. Now, okay, this, let's summarize what, uh, where this is going. We have the biological model and putting together our research and literature, it seems to be developing to a model can be added to our, our existing understanding. <clears throat> you develop a new infrared like photons, you affect the mitochondria. Uh, I talked about reactive oxygen species triggering off the release of biophotons, which can be delivered through microtubules and exons <clears throat> in an environment that's not supposed to allow it to happen, right? Uh, delivering through microtubules all over the place in quantum mechanics can allow for superpositions. 
And there is this group related to Stuart Amaroff and Roger Penrose looking at how it is affecting consciousness uh, is another interesting area to look at. And photons traveling through the exons could involve entanglement. So the photons could be going up, split, and be able to re relate to each, uh, each other again. It could be presented in the change in microstates and eventually directly um, it leads to the modulation of the brain. While we can understand biological, we now have a means to understand how is it happening quickly, rapidly like that. Now we are doing research uh, in my group and we collaboration from uh, some really good people. Uh, look, you know, in the penetration, in biophoton emission, effect of microtubules and the microstates, obviously. Another person who is presenting in this conference too is Jack Tijinsky, who is pretty well known in the field of quantum biology. And we have been doing some work on the effect on microtubules. He will speak more about it. But there is changes. You deliver near infrared light to the microtubules. You see changes. If you pulse it differently, you can see different pulses. So it is different between 10 hertz and say 1000 hertz, which we have been playing around with. So I'll leave that uh, more details to, to check. Now, we have also, uh, we have never stopped experimenting with what was possible with transcranial photobiomodulation. Uh, got involved with advanced meditators, mainly through Sanjay Manchanda. You see him, uh, you know, over, over the computer. On advanced meditators, we find that when we um, uh, stimulate, at, do a sweep of different frequencies at some higher frequencies, much higher than what we know of gamma, there it, it creates a switch. These advanced meditators already in the literature says they have endogenous fast frequencies in the brain. So when we deliver some fast frequencies, there seems to be some resonating effect and switch switching their, 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 their meditative state to something higher, almost like a, some form of en enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So we plan to do uh, research on this, which is uh, pretty soon, and Sanjay is the um, principal investigator. He will also speak about what his experience is. He's also speaking in this conference. And if you are an advanced meditator, you're in the Tucson area in Arizona, uh, he will be conducting the, the study. Uh, we hope to open another site in Toronto to do this. So, so in summary, I feel a revised model of transcranial photobiomodulation mechanism is needed to explain rapid, rapid and global brain response. Uh, the, the quantum mechanical elements help to fill these knowledge gaps. Future research should include investigating the quantum mechanics and how to harness new knowledge. So today, what seems extraordinary, maybe the norm in the future. So I want to thank all those who have collaborated with us, helped us, our talented stuff, and so on. Um, this is encouraging you to sign up to our newsletter to as we review our results of our, of our research. Uh, thank you for your time.